I guess to the extent that we would review nuclear and particle physics, I mean, <laughs> that's the topic I feel a little bit silly reviewing. We just reviewed it last Thursday, I think. Is um, what I would emphasize is sort of how all of this ties into particle physics. Because, so a good chunk of particle physics is kind of conceptual, um, um, well, conceptual, qualitative. That's kind of what I said when we started the covering chapter later, well, chapter 8, 10, and 11. I said, you know, it's going to be way more qualitative, not as much differential equations and integrals, just describing things. Um, so, as much as a big chunk of particle physics is that, as in, you know, describing the standard model, all the particles they found, electrons, neutrinos, muon, muon neutrino, tau lepton, tau neutrino, tau neutrino. So these are the leptons, and you have the quarks, down, up. I'm trying to put them in an order, more negative, less negative. Um, strange, charm, bottom, and top. So, you know, uh, leptons and quarks. And the other mediator bosons like the photon, W boson, Z boson, gluon, and the scalar boson. Higgs boson, all these are kind of things you can put on a poster and someone who has a zero mathematical understanding can at least, uh, wait, I lost my, I can at least uh, read the poster and kind of, oh, that's what that is. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Um, you know, don't forget that. I can still test you on that on final exam. But what I can now do, now that you have an exam that's so properly supposed to contain special relativity and particle physics, is I have now I now have this possibility, which I kind of used in exam three, so it's not as though I didn't use it already. I can combine particle physics and special relativity to ask you a special relativity question in the context of particle physics. Like imagine all these different interactions that we have talked about, um, things like a pair annihilation, when you have electron and positron annihilating turning into two photons. So um, the simple question to ask would be, well, what are the energies of the photons? That's easy, 0 0.5 MeV. Now I can ask you, well, if, uh, th so this could be positronium. If the positronium was moving at you know, 0.5 C, what are the energies of these two photons? Then you kind of need to do the Lorentz transformation of the <laughs> energy momentum thing of, um, so, so like, let me just list some of the particle interactions that you can analyze in a relativistic way. So I have that. I have pi meson decaying into two photons. You've already seen some of this. I have a pi meson decaying into muon and muon neutrino. Oops. Um, I have, I don't know, neutron decaying into proton plus electron and electron neutrino. I have a muon decaying into electron. I gave you the qualitative question in exam three. I can ask you the quantitative question on the final. Uh, electron. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Oh, uh, and there's the Compton scattering. There's um, so essentially kind of different versions of this where a photon scatters off of the electron and you still have electron and photon, but um, the energies have swapped and uh, changed around. And um, even though we didn't cover particle accelerators, I can ask this particle accelerator question as a special relativity question. Uh, what happens in LHC? So they have proton, proton collision, which can be used to produce antiprotons. So proton, proton, they, the original ones are there, but out of their energy, you can produce proton and antiproton. Or um, uh, you can have proton plus proton, and out of their energy, produce, I don't know, G W boson, W minus and W plus. And, oh, I guess the point is the possibilities are endless. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, 
so I wouldn't ask you to memorize any of these reactions. What I would want you to know are the rules around them. So one key part of the rule is this. If you are given enough of the dynamical quantities and you are asked the dynamics of the interaction or collision, using your knowledge of special relativity, you should be able to analyze that. You should be able to do the relativistically correct calculation of all these things given enough information. And usually I would be asking you for special case because once you have three body decay, this is the key part of the beta decay, right? <laughs> that um, that um, these energies are not, they are not determined. There, there's a range of possible values. So I would you know, ask you things like, um, um, like I would simplify, like if these two neutrinos are going in the same direction, so that electron is gaining the maximum possible energy or something like that. Um, but given, um, so, you know, once it's simplified down enough to a one dimensional case, then you ought to be able to uh, do it. So that's one. So, you know, all these different possible processes. Let's see. Um, Let's just say W bosons. Um, <laughs> once you have all these possible processes, then um, you should be able to analyze the dynamics of it. And that's kind of a special relativity question. There's nothing really limiting me <laughs> in what I can ask. And the other second thing that you, um, you, you should uh, uh, refresh and remember is the idea of conservation loss. So there are traditionally conserved quantities, energy, momentum, charge. Actually, en let's say energy and momentum, that's already covered by this. Um, so the well, beginning step of analyzing any of this is by saying four momentum is conserved. So energy and momentum are conserved. So it's the other conservation laws that's not automatically covered here, which would include things like a charge, something you already knew, but it's not, it's something that you kind of, uh, manually verify that neutral, neutral here, neutral here. Um, and we started in um, an angular momentum. Angular momentum is a little bit harder to check. So um, I think uh, you should at least be in, able to do this. That if you see decay of a muon into this, you ought to recognize that this cannot conserve angular momentum. Well, I think I forgot to put that on your exam three solution. But that would be something you could have mentioned. <laughs> but I think angular momentum is a little bit higher level thing. So if you kind of forget to mention it in a problem that doesn't explicitly mention it, I probably wouldn't um, flip out over it. <laughs> so charge angular momentum. And now you have the newly introduced quantities that are, um, some are absolutely conserved, those you ought to know. Uh, baryon number and lepton number, they are absolutely conserved. There are no processes which violate either of these. It's because lepton number, it's really um, related to the quantity of leptons. And the only known process can change one kind of lepton into another kind of lepton, but there's no known process that will destroy a lepton, except in an annihilation of a lepton and anti-lepton which is still conserves its lepton number. And baryon number, what it really is, is a one third of quark number, right? Every baryon has three of these quarks and no antiquarks or you know, no net antiquarks. So baryon number is really a third of the quark number. So quark number is also conserved. And you, so the reason um, mesons don't have a conserved quantities because it's a quark antiquark. So they have net quark number of zero anyway. Um, and then there's the last quote unquote conserved quantity that we covered that you should be familiar with. And I don't know how much I would test you on the final exam, but you know, you should know is the idea of conservation of um, quark and lepton flavor, as in what type. So, like conservation within these generations. When you have an electron number, uh, you retain that electron number when that turns into neutrino. 
when you have like up or downness, or the, uh, but or the thing that your textbook mentions specifically, and that's some uh, terminology that you should specifically know, is the idea of strangeness, which is tied to the number of strange quarks. Actually, strange quark is strangeness of minus one. Just call it accident of history. Um, you don't have to memorize that little factoid. But the idea that the uh, kind of number of strange quark is conserved is something you should know. In that, uh, that fact, plus that it's only um, approximately conserved. That this is only approximately conserved. Which means, um, so it can change. It just takes a little more time to make that change. And I think we kind of touched on this towards the last uh, of the class. I don't know if I would hold you to this. Um, did I hold you to this? I kind of do already. I kind of did on exam three, but not explicitly. What it means by approximately conserved is you have three different fundamental interactions that standard model deals with. So what things that are approximately conserved, they are really absolutely conserved, as in there's no uh, process that violates them. So absolutely conserved under ENM, electromagnetism, and strong interaction. So electromagnetic forces and the strong interaction um, so they don't violate um, they they don't violate uh, the quark and lepton flavor conservation. You can kind of see it in the elementary vertexes for those in the Feynman diagram. There's no elementary vertex that would change their flavor. There's nothing that would even change the down to up quark. So they are approximately conserved because they are absolutely conserved under electromagnetic and strong interaction, but they are not conserved, or sometimes not at all. Like just not at all, not conserved, under, and sometimes, you know, kind of approximately conserved under this too. But it comes down to they are not conserved under the weak interaction. So whenever you are looking at quantities that are only approximately conserved, really the reason they are not, you know, not absolutely conserved is because there's this interaction called the weak interaction that doesn't conserve that particular quantity. Um, but you know, weak interaction is, as the name says, it's weak. So it takes longer to take. So, um, so usually problem uh, text will kind of give you a hint. For example, like this kind of collision process. This uh, collision processes they more more or less have to happen by electromagnetic or strong interaction. So these will actually conserve uh, fla quark flavor. So in these collision interactions. Like no strange, no net strange quark can be produced because it takes way too long to happen. But once you have something that's produced, like once you have a K meson, then this K meson can decay into, uh, I guess it would decay into muon. It can decay into muon and um, muon neutrino, violating uh, conservation of uh, strangeness uh, because this would happen by weak decay, but the process that produces K meson, it has to produce them in pairs of K minus and K plus to preserve the net strangeness. Um, but you know, so the, if I, I, this is not an information that I expect you to have memorized, but if you are being told this in a problem statement, I don't want you to be surprised because <laughs> it's a kind of covered in the background material of approximate conservation. Um, and you know, there's obviously more particle physics, more nuclear physics, but once again, I feel silly covering it because we just did it last week. You haven't forgotten any since last week, right? So anything that's covered in exam three, it's still fair game. I'm just uh, highlighting here kind of uh, new things that I can put additionally more into your final exam by the fact that special relativity is a proper part of your final exam instead of just slipped under the door, <laughs> as was the case in your exam three. Yeah, questions, comments? I think that's more or less it. Um, I think uh, I would rather reserve any time um, before I have to go to campus to be there by four for any questions. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, 
Oh, oh, yeah, I, once again, I haven't covered any of this, but you guys all remember radioactivity, three different types of radiation, all that stuff, right? Yeah, so that could also, once again, appear in the final exam. Um, so if you have any questions, um, I'll stick around for as late as 3.45 to answer them, but um, otherwise, I think I, I'll just stop talking here. <laughs>